Good morning once again, brothers and sisters. Good morning. It's uh, <coughs> nice to be back here with you again this morning. Uh, Hilda, you said that um, going out witnessing and you don't see the fruits of it yet. Uh, well, I can tell you that I'm not here every week, but every time I come, I can see new people. Amen. So keep doing what you're doing because uh, that you're, you're being a witness. And um, if you remember Noah, he preached for 120 years. And the only people that got in the that ark with him was him and his family. So you're doing what God asks you to do, to witness, and that is what you're doing. So, and I can see the fruits of it. So that is good. So keep doing what you're doing. Um, while I was sitting there, I was thinking that we plan, but God ordered our steps. The reason for saying that is that I wasn't supposed to be here this week. I think I was supposed to be here two weeks time. So we've made plans that I would be here two weeks time, but God ordained it that I'd be here this week. And I think it's also very fortuitous that the message I have for you this morning, for us, not just for you, for us, because I'm included. Um, I think it's very fortuitous at this time. And as I go through, you'll see what I mean by that. Um, and thank you, David. We're in David for, um, I'm getting to know people's names. <laughs> who is who. Uh, but thank you very much for reading the text for us this morning. I think you read it from the King James Version? Yes, sir. Right, okay. I'm going to, well, not paraphrase, but my version. Very similar words in many, many respects, but I have the King James Version. So you will still recognize what um, I'm talking about this morning. So the, the message from our God this morning is found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, and the text that was read in your hearing is verses one to eight. I've titled the message, Comfort My People. We all know what is taking place, or what has taken place over the last couple of days in New Zealand. So this message, I think, even though, it, for me, it's very, Fortuitous that it that I should prepare a message at this time regarding comfort. God's people are to be comforted. The text says, "Comfort." Yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her. Tell her that her warfare has ended. Tell her that her iniquity has been pardoned. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness saying, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. And every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. Because the glory of the Lord <coughs> shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice says, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, all, and all of its loveliness is like a flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely, the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Amen. Can we pray? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're gathered in your house this morning. 
we have come to worship and to seek your blessing. Father, please fill us with wisdom and understanding. And let your Holy Spirit guide us in all truth, so your name may be glorified. Mm -hmm. And now let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, and my God, and my strength, and my Redeemer. Amen. Amen. My friends, comfort. There are at least two ways of looking at comfort. One of them is about feelings and emotions, with nothing behind it but a good heart and good intentions. Then the other way of looking at comfort is to actually do something about what is causing that discomfort whether it is grief or pain or whatever it is, and do something about it. And today, we need the second sort of comfort. We need to know, and we need to see, and we need to feel comfort from the pressures and the dangers that all that surrounds us all. You probably don't know this, but I grew up in a, in a large city with thousands of people around me. Yet at that time, I felt no discomfort. I felt no fear. But as I'm getting older, I'm beginning, I can admit, I'm beginning to, fear, to be fearful at times, especially in the nights, if I'm, out, if I'm out on the streets. So I need to be comforted. <clears throat> as a country, we're facing a, a change as Britain prepares to attempts to leave the European Union. One which does not bode very well in the minds of some people, especially big businesses and, and, and politicians. We have terrorism knocking at our doors throughout the world. We have Boko Haram, we have ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, and, and others. Only yesterday, or I think it was yesterday or Thursday, we've heard of atrocities in New Zealand, where dozens of people have lost their lives. My friends, I believe we need to be comforted. We need comfort. We just don't know, and we, we all must deal with the pain of aging and, and the fears of the changes that we see in this world. But we must also face the truth about who we are and how personally we have sinned, and how little, how little we deserve from God. My friends, we need to be comforted. We need comfort. And in our Old Testament text this morning, Isaiah told us, he holds out to us, what he holds out to us is the true comfort. He doesn't merely address his our feelings. He doesn't ignore those feelings. But he speaks God's words to us. And he talks about the reality of that comfort. What, what was done and accomplished so that we might have real and lasting comfort. So I invite you once again this morning to listen to what the somewhat familiar words of Isaiah and consider that this is true comfort. This is the real comfort. He begins with God's words uh, of comfort, saying, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says, the, says our God. Speak kindly or tenderly to Jerusalem and call out to her. Tell her that her warfare has ended, 
Tell her that her iniquity has been removed. Tell her that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. My friends, um, in these words, we see the will of God that his people are to be comforted and strengthened. He says, comfort my people. He says, and, he, and how does he say we are supposed to do that? We are supposed to speak kindly or tenderly to Jerusalem and tell them that their troubles are over, that their sins have been forgiven, that their punishment is complete and finished for all time. My dear friends, perhaps you notice that the prophet calls Jerusalem her. That is because Jerusalem in that term is a figure of speech for God's chosen people, the church, the bride of Jesus Christ. So naturally she is called a she or a her. Therefore, the prophet is commanded to proclaim the comfort of God to the church, you and me, the chosen people of God. Now, what is that comfort? It is that God has forgiven them their sins, our sins. Their sins, your sins, my sins, has been removed. And why is that comfort? My friends, it is comfort because sin is the immediate cause of all our troubles. You think about it. Sin is the immediate cause of all our troubles. Sin causes us to fear because no one caught up in sin can trust God. Sin is, is the source of pain. Sin is the reason why Things go wrong with our lives. Sickness is a symptom of sin. The deliberatives of age are a consequence of sin. These things are true about sin because it is the very rejection of, of the authority of life and of health. The forgiveness of sin, the forgiveness of our sins, are not just and not just of specific sins. It means that all the troubles associated with sin are also removed. That is it. For example, when what the healing miracles of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, were primarily about, when he says, your sins are forgiven, and then heal them, or heal the people, illustrating the connection between sin and the melodies of life. Here, forgiveness is the message following, tell her that her warfare is ended. Her warfare, her troubles were ended because her sins have been forgiven. Now consider this prophecy it was spoken a couple of hundred years before the, construction, the, the um, destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC and the captivity which followed before um, the earthly city of Jerusalem <coughs> would desperately need this sort of comfort. The end of her warfare and the forgiveness of her iniquity were things uh, to be taken by faith. Our forgiveness is also to be taken by faith. Our sins have been forgiven. All the symptoms and ailments caused by sin have been ended. But our daily experiences tells us that we haven't yet come entirely to the end. Yes, we have the forgiveness. And we have the promise. Just like ancient Israel, that the victory is won and our troubles are over. What we actually lack, my friends, at this very moment, this moment in time, 
is the experience of that reality. Just as those of whom the Prophet first spoke these words lack the outward, outward reality or the destruction and captivity as well as the rescue and return to validate the word of the Prophet. My friends, we walk by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. When we look back in history as we read these words, it is easy for us to mistakenly believe that the words of comfort of, of Isaiah were intended for Old Testament Jerusalem and the people in those days. They would read them, and I would guess that God intended for them uh, to find the comfort of which he spoke, even as it applied to their political and national situation. But the meaning, the meaning of the text, is not that the destruction of Jerusalem and the Babylonian captivity, captivity being dissolved or removed. The meaning of the text is that Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our Savior, Yahshua, and the forgiveness of our sin should give us comfort. The forgiveness, to know that the forgiveness of our sins has been forgiven. If we accept, that should give us comfort. The life of ancient Israel was simply a moving example, an analogy in history. If we look at 1 Corinthians 10, 10 and verse 11, it speaks of Old Testament events. It says, now all these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our admonition or our instruction upon whom the end of the age has come. Their real life experience were God illustrating in earthly history the, the, uh, the spiritual truth of his people, both Old and New Testament. My friends, we, we are the unfaithful Israel. We have been called and made, made God's people by his gracious choice. We have been rescued. Our sins have been forgiven. Our sins have been forgiven. And why? Isaiah says, she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The payment has been made. Isaiah would have naturally thought of the captivity, or Israel rather, would have naturally thought of the captivity as punishment. They would have believed that they had finally paid their way out of God's wrath. And now, God was going to be good to them again. But they could not undo the wrongs of their unfaithfulness any more than you and I can undo the sins that we have already committed. <coughs> the difficulties of the life of Israel was God's way of purifying them, cleaning out the hypocrisies, changing them. The troubles in our lives are perhaps God's way of working in us, purifying us, training us in faith and perseverance and endurance. But that does not pay for our sins. My friends, our sins have already been paid for. They have been fully, they have been fully atoned for. God has poured out his wrath over our sins. And he has poured it out to the full until the cup of his wrath is empty. My dear friends, he poured it out on our Savior. He poured it out on Yahshua, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, on the cross. Then Jesus rose from the dead as the proclamation of this same comfort. We have received double 
for all our sins. Full payment. Every little bit. Only, only. We did not endure it ourselves. The full payment has been made. But we did not endure it ourselves. Our Saviour, Messiah, Jesus Christ, Yahshua, He bore our sins. He did it for us. Your sins and mine have been forgiven. We have been given the gift of salvation and everlasting life in glory. So I, I encourage you today, <coughs> don't fear, do not fear. Do not be confused by the troubles and fears and sorrows in your life and what we see around the world. They're but a passing thing. They're just passing. Your sins and mine have been removed. As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your iniquity from you. That is what God is saying. We accept our Savior. And He and we have repented. And He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. Now, in our earthly mind, think about that. That is a far distance. That's how far God has removed our sins from us. So my dear friends, be comforted. Be at peace. The Lord your God is with you to bless you and to love you for your sins have been taken away from you. Now, that, for me, I hope it's the same for you, that is the true comfort, to know that our sins have been taken away from us. Then the prophet changes. He tells us to prepare. He tells us to prepare for the Lord to come. He says, a voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. My friends, it is, it is our hearts, not the landscape, that needs the work. Our sinful hearts and minds are the wilderness that needs to be prepared. It says, let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low and let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad highway. The mountains are our human pride, our works, our faith, our, our great piety. We need, we need to knock them down. We are not saved because of who we are or how we do anything. We are not saved by that. My dear friends, we are saved because of what Christ did for us on the cross and the glorious grace, grace of our Father in heaven. That's why we are saved. The valleys, the valleys are the pits of our unworthiness, our self-deprecation, our depression. We have no need to fear and we have no reason to, 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 to withhold ourselves from trusting God and His grace until we feel that we're worthy. You know, sometimes we witness to people and you ask them to make a choice and they say, I'm not ready or I can't make a choice. What they don't realize is by the very fact that they say they, they, they can't, can't make a choice. They have made a choice. They just made a choice not to accept God or accept what the Messiah has done for us. You know, the devil is so cunning. If we allow him, he will twist our minds. Because his whole purpose is not to get us to heaven. His whole purpose is to see us destroyed. So I, tell, I say again, the valleys are the pits of our unworthiness, our uh, self deprecation and our sort of depression. We, we, we have to 
We don't have to fear, and we have no reason to, on, to, to feel that we're not worthy. Because we cannot be worthy. We cannot do anything in ourselves to be worthy. God has, God has claimed us. God has chosen us. And God has called us. We are His by His works. By His choice. And by His gift. By His. We need to hear that message loud and clear. We need to confess that message. We need to believe that message and to proclaim that message to all so others can hear and others can know. The people who live around us, the people who we work with, our friends, all need to hear this message as badly as we do. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. My friends, the glory of the Lord is his great goodness and love and grace that he has, that he has saved us with a salvation so free and so wonderful. He, say, he has paid the price. We are, and we receive the full benefits. God the Father sent his Son to pay the price for our sins. And we receive the full benefits. That is our Lord's glory. And on that last day, the whole world will see that glory of the Lord together. There is no secret rapture anywhere. There's nobody coming somewhere else and nobody will, you know, say, well, he's over there or he's down there or he's behind there. The whole world will see it together. That has been a lot, there's been a lot of talk lately about change. Not only are things changing, but people seem to be hungry for change. The old ways and the old truth are simply not, not enough anymore for some people. They don't, they don't relate to it. They, 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 they're not effective. People are turning in other directions uh, for comfort today. The movement in some Christian church today are things that like um, what they call the, the uh, emerging church, Emer whatever that is, the emerging church. It describes itself as um, evangelical, post-evangelical, liberal, post-liberal, charismatic, neo-charismatic, uh, and, and post-charismatic. I don't even know what those means, but that's how they describe themselves. The focus of this movement in modern church is, is that, is a, is a total revamping of modern Christian worship, modern evangelism. And the, and the nature of, of modern Christian community. The people in these movements often um, favor the use of simple stories and, and narratives rather than doctrine. That's what they, they do. Some people often place a higher value on good works and on social um, activism, echoing the, the Protestant <coughs> deeds, not creeds. Emphasis, something sometimes including um, missional living. Now, the key themes of the emerging church are set in terms of what they call praxis oriented lifestyle, and that often incorporate um, political elements. While the Christian church emphasizes eternal salvation. Many in the emerging church emphasizes the here and now and not eternal salvation. They emphasize the here and now and the need to create a kingdom of heaven on earth now. My friend, the Bible says there is nothing new under the sun. I have heard some people say that the Bible and our doctrines are no longer relevant. 
that it doesn't apply to life? They say, my friends, God had already addressed that issue. A voice says, call out. Then he said, then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely, the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. God's answer is that however much things change, his word, his wonderful gospel, do not. We can lighten ourselves to the grass. It comes and it goes. And it's so fragile and temporary. We are the grass. We are fragile and temporary. You know, when I, when I was young, when I was a young man, Life seems so permanent and long uh, until I, until most of it is behind me. And I look back, I look back at it and I see that it is so quick and it's so brief. The Bible says, the grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely, the people are grass. I don't know if you've heard of a this guy named Phil Harris. He spoke the same thing years ago in, in a song called um, Old Man Time. I won't try and sing it for you. But it started like this. He says, he gives you beauty, style, and grace. And then he put wrinkles on your face. That old man, <laughs> old man time. Uh, it's funny. You know, when we watch an old film, or we hear someone say, oh wow, that was the 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s. We're, we are too modern and, and we're too in the know for all that stuff. We may laugh because those comments are so silly. But somehow, every generation here hears someone says something similar about their own moment in history and they think that it rings profound. But God's perspective, my friend, is much longer than ours. God's perspective is far greater than ours. <coughs> the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Stands forever. The gospel is our only hope and our only comfort. And the changing winds of time cannot touch it. People come and go, but God's word is true. His promises are unchanging. Our salvation is sure. You know why? Because God guarantees it. Our sins have been forgiven. We call it, um, we call it uh, remission, remission of sins. The word remission means to send it away. God says, tell Jerusalem that her iniquity has been removed. This comfort doesn't rest <coughs> upon our opinion. It doesn't rest on us. It isn't a fad or, or a fashion or, or some other creature of time. It is the word of God. It is the truth of God. It is the gift of God, it is the gospel, and it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. My dear friends, it cannot change. Don't get me wrong, people are always trying to change it. But if we change it, it is no longer the gospel. It doesn't need to be improved. It cannot be destroyed. We can abandon it, but guess what? It will not abandon us. We can abandon it, but it will not abandon us. We can mess it up and proclaim something else, 
much more in keeping with our time. But that something else won't have the power to save. It won't have God's promise of salvation. It won't have the power to comfort anyone. And God has been calling us through the centuries, through his unchanging word, to proclaim his comfort. God's people are to be comforted. Comfort. Yes. Comfort, my people, says your God. Speak kindly, or even speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And call out to her. Tell her that her warfare has ended. Tell her that her iniquity has been removed. Tell her that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. My dear friends, that is the true comfort. May this be the experience of all of us who call upon the Lord that we will receive true comfort. May God bless you as you wait for him. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
us pray. And now may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord give you his peace in your going out and in your coming in, in your lying down and in your rising up, in your labour and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears, until you come to stand before our Saviour in that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. In our Saviour's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.